the best case scenario for wind and solar over the next five to 10 to 20 years? I think the best case scenario for uh, wind and solar <laughs> would be to uh, cut subsidies for fossil fuels, both the direct and indirect, um, so that there could be more of an even playing field for renewables. Um, that could accelerate the transition. Um, right now, direct so government subsidies to fossil fuels are around the world are on the order of 600 billion or more, and these indirect subsidies are, are far uh, make that number far larger. Um, but even with the playing field dramatically uneven and subsidies to renewables, um, less than half that of those for, for fossil fuels, the cost of renewables are falling. And that's because once you put up your wind turbine, once you put up your solar panels, the cost of the fuel is free. So, so even with the market not telling the truth, even with the market being unequal, I think um, at wind and solar, um, costs will continue to go down and the, and the market will drive um, those to be the choice for, for many corporations and for individuals. Are there any technological breakthroughs that will allow solar or wind to become even far more efficient than it already is? I don't think we need technological breakthroughs per se. Um, solar and wind uh, energy, they have become more efficient over the years. I think wind turbines in particular, they're taller now, so they can harvest a, a wider um, range of wind um, and get the high speed, uh, taller winds. Um, solar panels themselves, the efficiency certainly has improved in, in recent years. Um, and new solar technologies that are pretty exciting are uh, thin film solar or flat solar panels that can basically basically be integrated into roofing tiles, solar uh, technologies that can be used in windows or even in curtains and other materials. I think there's a lot of interesting research happening there. Um, do we need those to make the energy transition? No. I think even with current technologies not advancing at all, uh, we can make the transition to wind and solar and still power our economies. Um, are there ways to do it that are um, more interesting or costs can fall, certainly, and I think there, there's going to be exciting advancements in the future. Do solar or wind require water or some other natural resource to work? In the actual functioning of a solar farm or a wind farm, uh, the demands on natural resources on water are, are relatively small, um, certainly in the production of things of steel or of um, the various silicon technologies. You, you do use water, you use energy, um, but once they're up and running, their demands are relatively small. Uh, solar does uh, cover more area to produce a given um, kilowatt hour of electricity than wind, um, but solar works great on marginal lands or on rooftops, um, so it can, it can exist in the middle of our cities, whereas uh, wind farms generally are better um, on farmlands and ranch lands where um, instead of the NIMBY problem, not in my backyard, farmers and ranchers are saying, put the wind, tar wind uh, turbine here because then I can continue to graze my cattle or grow corn or soybeans, um, but make money from the royalties of the wind and keep that, that wind um, energy local, local community energy and, and local jobs to, to put those things up. How great is geothermal potential? Geothermal is another source of renewable energy that makes sense in, in certain parts of the world. Geothermal is not as widespread as wind and solar that can be used in any country on Earth. Um, but in some places, uh, geothermal energy can, can be used to produce electricity. Uh, major hotspots are in the so-called ring of fire around the Pacific. So California currently is the world's leading producer of electricity. Um, from geothermal energy, but um, all around that ring, Japan um, has tremendous geothermal resources, and, and that could be an attractive pathway as the country is trying to move away from nuclear energy. Um, Indonesia, um, the Philippines have enormous geothermal resources, and in Indonesia, the state oil company, Pertamina, is a heavy investor in geothermal technology for electricity production. Um, Iceland is one of the world's geothermal 
leaders getting a, a large share of its electricity from the earth and also uses the earth's energy for, for heating. Um, and it has interesting applications. You can use it to, to heat fish farms or to uh, clear sidewalks of snow if you're running the pipes in the, in the right places. Um, and then ground source heating, like a heat pump, um, which is sometimes called geothermal, um, those can be used in residential places almost anywhere. Um, say a typical American home could install a ground source heat pump and very efficiently uh, use the constant temperature um, below the soil to uh, efficiently heat, uh, heat or cool homes. What's the potential of hydropower and what are the pros and cons? Can the world's 45,000 dams all generate hydropower? Yeah, hydropower now um, is a source of about 16% of the world's electricity production. Uh, so it's a, an, it's a can be a, a fairly stable, constant source of electricity. Um, right now, the world does have about 45,000 large dams and less than 9,000 of them are actually generating electricity. So when we wanna look at the future of hydropower, you can say, well, what rivers are left to be dammed? Well, there's not many rivers left in the world that have not been dammed or altered in some major way, but just powering um, those existing dams could be a great way to produce electricity without creating additional environmental disruption. There are a few places in the world that are looking at building new um, hydropower dams, large scale, um, very few left, but the Congo River is one. Um, some of the rivers up in the Himalayas and the Mekong have places where um, China in particular is looking at um, putting up dams. India is looking at putting up some dams. Um, new dams do tend to create environmental disruption. Um, the run of the river it could disrupt the amount of water moving, and it can create some geopolitical tensions if uh, one country feels that another is stealing its water supply. <laughs> but so, so that's one reason why powering existing dams um, is, is very attractive without that kind of disruption. Um, another thing about hydropower that is exciting in a renewable energy economy is that you can uh, create so-called pumped storage systems, basically when say your wind turbines are spinning fast, faster and producing more electricity than a community can, can use. You can use that energy to pump water uphill and then maybe when the wind slows down, you can release that water and then use that to generate energy. So it can help um, balance the system and we have some of these pump storage systems, a number in Europe, um, California has some as well and, and that's an exciting way to use um, water to produce electricity. What's the potential of wind power, the cost to do it, and the time frame? Wind costs have come down dramatically, and now um, wind large power purchase agreements are buying wind at two to three cents a kilowatt hour, which compares to, say, the United States average of about 10 or 11 cents per kilowatt hour. So wind is increasingly cheap. Um, the production, anytime you're ramping up production of something and pro can produce more turbines at scale, um, costs of the actual physical infrastructure goes down. So um, the future for wind on an economic front is, is very bright. What's the potential of solar power, the cost to do it in the time frame? Solar costs are falling incredibly fast. Um, this is one of the exciting things in renewable energy, I think. I put solar panels on my roof in Washington, D.C. in about 2009, and since then, the cost of the panels themselves have actually fallen about 75%. Now, this wasn't a mistake on my part. It still was um, a wise purchase because I'm uh, generating my electricity uh, for free from the sun, but um, panel costs are definitely going down, making it much more affordable for, for people around the world. And, um, we can thank Germany in part for that because their large solar incentives um, really helped create a market for creating solar panels and allowed China to become a world manufacturing hotspot for the panels. Uh, and for many years, uh, the panels were still too expensive for the Chinese market, but as the economies of scale kicked in, um, China is now the world's largest solar panel producer, but also 
a consumer of solar panels and generator electricity with solar. Are there any leaking oil wells anymore? Did we learn anything from the BP oil field? The oil industry did learn a lot of lessons after the um, Deepwater Horizon disaster in 2010 in the Gulf of Mexico, where we had this oil rig explosion, a well blowout, um, and sending tons of oil into the Gulf, um, where it took, it took weeks before BP was able to figure out how to cap this oil well. I think the industry certainly has learned some cautionary lessons um, after, after that disaster, and the industry certainly takes safety. Um, it's, par it's paramount in the industry. That being said, um, any time you're dr drilling a well, particularly in deep water, um, there is going to be oil spilled into the environment. Um, the risk of an oil spill increases dramatically as you go deeper and deeper um, into the ocean, and it becomes much harder to do any kind of remediation or cleanup once you get into deep water. So if you look at trends in um, offshore oil production nowadays, we are going deeper, um, and we are, we are drilling more wells in, in riskier um, scenarios. So additional oil spills um, are inevitable, whether that's on the scale of gallons, which will happen, um, or hundreds of thousands of gallons, we don't know. Um, and in fact, the industry itself has not been great at monitoring these things. There was actually um, some, some researchers were trying to study the area of the Gulf of Mexico around the Deepwater Horizon spill. And they were noticing by studying satellite images that there were increasing amounts of oil appearing at the surface even after that well was capped. And they said, well, wait a minute, where is this coming? And they were able to use that satellite technology, these eyes in the sky, uh, to find out that a different well uh, by a company called Taylor Energy um, was continuing, had, had um, been disrupted during, I think a hurricane had caused um, a mudslide underwater, dis disrupting the well and ending up spilling more oil, potentially more oil over the years into the Gulf of Mexico than the Deepwater Horizon explosion did itself. And, and people didn't know about this until researchers were looking at the satellite imagery. So, um, you know, this is playing out in the Gulf of Mexico. There's offshore oil wells off of California and, and around the world in the North Sea. Um, off of Africa, Brazil has had some major deep water finds recently and is looking to really ramp up that industry. And it's, it's an area that's really fraught with risk. Um, in, in temperate areas, it's risky. And then if you move into the Arctic, where it's cold, remote, there's not the kind of infrastructure to deal with any problems, I think that's where you're going to see spills become um, incredibly, uh, incredibly risky.